Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте, Мария, еще раз. Здравствуйте, дорогие друзья. Я всех приветствую. Меня зовут Алексей Глухов. И у нас сегодня замечательное событие в рамках нашего научного семинара. Школа философии и культурологии выступает Кетти Чухров. Она представляет свою книгу «Practicing the good, desire and boredom in the Soviet Uh, in, in Soviet Socialism. Uh, и у нас uh, есть замечательные комментаторы, uh, оппоненты, uh, которых uh, будет повод тоже представить. Пока мы еще uh, собираемся, я uh, еще замечу, что uh, наш семинар двуязычный, поэтому часть объявлений, видимо, мне как модератору нужно будет uh, тоже делать на английском языке, но все могут uh, подавать свои реплики на о том языке, на котором вы желаете, да, и высказываться на том языке, на котором вы желаете, переводчик у нас, к сожалению, синхронных не предполагается. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, um, uh, it's an honor uh, to me uh, to um, uh, host you uh, uh, here. Uh, this is our uh, academic uh, philosophical uh, seminar, uh, School of Philosophy, uh, HSE, and uh, this is our regular seminar, but uh, in uh, exceptional occasion, we have uh, Katya Chukrov here, who uh, will be presenting her uh, recent book, uh, Practicing the Good, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism. And uh, so we are still waiting for uh, others to join us. And uh, so if you uh, have any questions uh, in advance uh, concerning the procedure, uh, this is um, uh, the, uh, the proper time to Uh, uh, to ask them. Uh, um, uh, our working languages are Russian and English, so we don't have uh, interpreters, uh, and everyone is free to speak the language uh, of the of your choice. Uh, uh, hello, hello there. Hi, this is this is Hi, John, John. John Roberts. Um, what what is the what is the order um, of speakers? Um, um, just a moment, we, we're trying to figure it out. Uh, I, I have to ask one question from our um, uh, scientific supervisor of this seminar, Professor uh, Vadim Natanovich Poros. Uh, Vadim Natanovich, будут какие-то с вашей стороны реплики, или он сейчас отошел как раз? Vadim Natanovich, вы будете что-то говорить в начале этого семинара? Нет, уважаемые коллеги, все сказано. Я поздравляю всех с новым заседанием нашего интенсивно работающего семинара Вольфила. Я очень рад видеть здесь старых друзей, которых давно не видел. Андрей, привет. Вот. Да и всех нас. Я желаю успеха нашему семинару. Окей, спасибо большое Uh, for that and uh, so we, the the procedure so we uh, as uh, we uh, uh, agreed with uh, Katie uh, first uh, we will uh, give your uh, give your time uh, to present your book um, uh, half an hour uh, and then uh, after that uh, we have um, a, uh, so a group of uh, Uh, of opponents and, and commenters, and uh, you will have um, seven to ten minutes uh, for, uh, for for what you want to, to share with us. And uh, it, so we don't have any particular order, uh, but, um, but uh, just to tell Alexei, yes. um, Nikolai Sorin Chaikov told me that he doesn't want to be the first. Yeah. Yes, yes, I received the message uh, from him as well. Uh, so then uh, we, uh, we have other uh, commenters, uh, uh, Professor John Roberts here. Um, Hello, uh, hi. Yes. Ilya <laughs> um, uh, uh, Budraitskis uh, uh, here. Yes. Uh, then um, Andrei uh, Maidanski is here as well. Uh, And uh, finally, uh, Nikolai uh, Sorin uh, Chaikov, uh, who will be joining us later. Uh, so uh, we... I'm already here, yes. Uh, I'm... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're, you're here, yes. 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 yes, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, then uh, without uh, further ado, I yield the floor uh, to Katie, please. Um, uh, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Thank you for organizing this session and 
thanks everyone to be present and I would like to thank uh, all the speakers that agreed to join me and to discuss this book and first and foremost I would like to thank John Roberts who was my supervisor during my Marie Curie uh, fellowship in London and Wolverhampton University and without his contributions and uh, discussions probably this book wouldn't be uh, possible. Also, I would like to thank uh, the EFLUX uh, uh, publishing house as well as University of Minnesota Press. Uh, well, uh, the book um, is called uh, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism and uh, usually the question is always concerning the, the title, why desire, why boredom, what is the methodology, is it uh, a historiographic study of the Soviet context, is it a Slavonic study, so just to answer all those questions about the context and uh, methodological framework of the book, I will uh, follow my paper, uh, and it will take me maybe 25, 30 minutes. Um, so I will try to delineate the features of methodology of my research. Uh, there are three main vectors in the studies of historical socialism. First, historiographic study, implying analysis of various heritages, literary, philosophic, artistic, uh, including archeology span and anthropology of sociality and lifestyles. Um, second method is studies of concrete personalia in culture philosophy in the context of broader theoretic phenomena, which pertains to the field of comparative studies. And third is critique of ideology and its social and historical consequences in the frame of communist past or October revolution from the either affirmative or derogatory uh, perspective. This, um, apart from certain exceptions, we deal in this case with historical socialism as the domain of archaeology, certain sort of antiquity, which never becomes a contemporary political or critical tool. And interestingly, such archaeological view prevails equally among the anti-Soviet Cold War standpoints, as well as in the leftist research of historical socialism since uh, the 60s. This entails two consequences, this archaeological um, squeezing of the Soviet experience into antiquity, uh, that if one researches, let's say, the works of Vygotsky or Ilyenkov, one rarely shifts to the concrete politeconomic realia or material culture or production. And um, the figures of personalia of Soviet Marxism are then often researched uh, uh, in certain sorts of ghetto without being inscribed into the worldwide context of critical theory. For example, when you submit um, a text on the Soviet philosophy into the Slavonic journal, uh, and you have references to Negri or Deleuze, there is always some kind of uh, um, argument that these two contexts are not connected. So, uh, and vice versa, the scholars specializing, um, um, uh, the Marxist theorists uh, generally often dismiss Soviet Marxist theory as pre-modern or outdated. So, uh, um, uh, quite a number of institutional and methodological uh, problems here, as you see. And uh, the path that I chose to follow in this connection enabled me to ground the analysis of cultural and philosophic edifices of socialism on politeconomic factors, such as the eradicated private property, for example, that is consider theoretical, ideological and socioeconomic aspects on one plane. So I, Mm, uh, uh, this is the reason why I um, unified in the books four parts, which usually in the research are impossible to unify, political economy, sexuality, aesthetics, philosophy. And such approach encompassing the thought, the theory on the one hand, and the modes of living in the conditions of socialist economy on the other, uh, had to prove interdependence of the 
epistems of thought uh, with the politeconomic disposition. So what was important for me to connect somehow the philosophic epistems and to show how dependent they are on the politeconomic uh, dispositions of the socialist society. But this inevitably led me to the comparison of the Soviet imaginaries of emancipation with the Western anti-capitalist critique amidst um, capitalism. Um, so, uh, this enabled not only to unravel how cultural and philosophic categories function in the socialist conditions, but also to apply socialist political economy and socialist ethics as a litmus paper of discerning the problems in the Western post-war emancipatory theory since Althusser, or generally speaking in the anti-capitalist Western Marxist critique. So this book to a certain extent is not simply about Soviet context and Soviet thought, but it checks the emancipation theories uh, of the 60s uh, in the Western context as well. Now, what were the principal landmarks in questioning why the similar notions such as Mm, uh, the ideal culture, consciousness, desire, pleasure, the universal language, labor, uh, uh, produce converse impact in the context of capitalist leftism and the socialist one. So this was really important for me to, to compare why the same epistems and the same notions uh, function in a converse way. And the result of this comparison was the following. What was dismissed negatively as metaphysical, idealist, authoritarian, and even marked as ideology in the post althusserian critical thought, um, I already enumerated those notions, culture, ideal, the universal, the common good. The same notions were acquiring affirmative and materialist connotations in the thought of historical socialism. And uh, in one of my research texts preceding the book, The Epistemological Gaps Between the Soviet East and the Democratic West, mm -hmm. this was the title, I tried to argue that the socio-political differences between historical socialism and the liberal democratic and generally Western leftism arise from divergent epistemological treatment of notions listed above. And just to mention a couple of examples of how they function differently. For example, we all know the dismissal of the unconscious in the Soviet philosophy and psychology in the works of Voloshinov, Ilyenko, Vygotsky, Leontiev. And of course, I had to account for this divergence and difference. Or the apologia among the Soviet thinkers uh, of such notions as culture and ideal. Uh, when these concepts had been completely defied since Adorno's aesthetic theory, Freud's psychoanalysis, or further on uh, in the critique of ideology uh, after Althusser. Or let's take the notion of the classical or realism in art and aesthetics, which traditionally are regarded as the outcome of partocratic cultural politics, but in my book I treat them as the regimes of de-alienation. Uh, and last but not least, uh, 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 the, the role of language, how language is criticized. Uh, for example, in Ilyenkov's philosophy or Alexei Leontiev's psychology, what is placed before language, ahead of language, is not the unconscious or any instinctive drives or affectations, but this is the imprint of history, culture. So something that stands before the abstraction and generalization of language is even more general, is even more nominal. In other words, the potentialities of the generic, this is what stands uh, behind the language or ahead of language, an approach that would be impossible in psychoanalysis, structuralism, or even more so in post-structuralism. Um, so, as the book argues, these divergences between East and West are not about geopolitics and are not about East and West, actually, but they 
have politeconomic causality, which means that these drastically converse approaches in the socialist and capitalist context, respectively, um, uh, to the essential notions forming ontology, sociality, do not derive from party imperatives, but they are consequences of sequestered capitalism. So I was trying to consider those divergences through abolished private property and certain features of um, uh, use value economy as against the surplus value economics. In other words, the notions that in the conditions of capitalist production denote certain universal rules of ontology and henceforth function as dead abstractions in the context of socialism acquire concrete material body and appliance. Such notions as I already listed, culture, the ideal, language, the universal. And actually, if we look at the book of uh, Evald Elyonkov, uh, The Dialectics of the Abstract and the Concrete, it is dedicated completely to how general and immaterial abstract phenomena such as value or language or the ideal are formed by means of material concretions and are therefore both general and materially embodied. Um, meanwhile, uh, parallel to this in capitalist conditions, the social constructivism and teleology uh, become the representations of rule, power, order, so that even the common good has to be undermined, as it can only be the false and illusory common good. Therefore, all the notions that represent a certain social constructivism are immediately lab labeled as apparatuses, as order, uh, as subjugation. And interestingly, now I will shift to the problematics of mind and matter, because this was crucial and essential, how to converge and how to unify mind and matter, this huge metaphysical problem of the dualism of mind and matter. And uh, it's really a diagnosis and, and it's really symptom symptomatic what happened to this dualism, for instance, uh, starting from post-structuralism uh, up to post-humanist uh, theories of contemporaneity. Mm, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this was the crucial issue to be solved as well, uh, uh, how, to, how to twist this duality into unification. And what we see in post-human theories is that they solve this dualism this rupture between the mind and matter, between nominal and material empirical categories uh, through uh, either um, uh, choosing algorithmicized mind, like for instance, Riza Nigaristani or Ray Kurzweil. So they either choose the total rationalization, uh, the mathematized mind, or others such as Bruno Latour, Donna Haraway, Karen Barat, um, actor network theory completely dismiss the realms of the idea, the language, uh, any extracorporeal or transcendental categories, um, dismiss the necessity of conceptual parameters in favor of delegating uh, meaning production to pure performative agency of empirical elements, the path that chooses performative nominalism. And in both cases, whether choosing abstract mind and linguistic mathematicized categories uh, or the empirical performatism, we fall into the trap of abstraction. Uh, and just to add that human being um, is the combination of mind and matter. So uh, it is clear that if there is no possibility to connect these two uh, categories, then uh, the human being disperses and splits and 
therefore it is only natural that we have to come to post-human theory. Whereas in classical metaphysics, for instance, there were problems, there were ruptures between mind and matter, but these two categories were uh, kept in tension through various methodologies and dialectics was one of them. Uh, thus, uh, I had to follow Ilyenkov's approach uh, in this treatment of um, mind and matter, uh, uh, because we see uh, in socialist psychology and in Marxist thought persistent conviction that Marxist theory could facilitate resolving um, this problem of metaphysics. So mm, the claim of uh, so socialist philosophy was that they could uh, somehow facilitate convergence of mind and body. Yet uh, this could not be done performatively, but had to be done through materialist uh, dialectics. And now I will try to show how political economy uh, is used to prove that this uh, realization of metaphysical or gnosiological problem is possible in thought. Uh, uh, and, and this uh, was, of course, the idea of uh, Ilyenko that with the revolutionary turnover of the sociality, not only the modes of production, but the very material basis even the ontic parameters of being change. And consequently, such changes entail new epistemologies. Um, not only social infrastructure transforms in a deprivatized economy, but also the conditions of materiality. Uh, and in this sense, Ilyenko's theory of the ideal would be difficult to imagine without the politeconomic conditions of socialism and without his reliance on the Marxist political economy. And uh, when I claim this, many researchers, they try to fiercely argue this because they want to look upon the, the um, uh, interpretation of the ideal by Ilyenkov separately from dependence of this issue uh, on the political economy. And uh, actually Ilyenkov himself answers this puzzle about the um, uh, fusion and connectedness uh, of the issues of the ideal, of the issues of how to converge mind and body and the political economy of Marxist-Leninist uh, method. Uh, he claims that in his piece, question of identity of thought and being in pre-Marxist of philosophy and explicitly says that identification of thought and reality uh, could be mm, accomplished in practice only uh, in the Marxist, uh, through the Marxist theory and only this would enable uh, uh, to, identify, to identify nominal and material parameters. Uh, and um, uh, why? Because the eidetic, generic, basic function of a material thing manifests itself at its best in a deprivatized economy and due to the sequestered surplus value in uh, economic production. And I quote Ilyenkov here, Marxism also takes into account the fact that under conditions of the division of labor and the alienation of thought, the transformation of being into thought and thought into being takes place via an extremely complex prism of mediations that is of purely social nature. Uh, which means that by this assertion, Ilyenkov emphasizes that capitalist political economy hampers the possibility of converging thought and being, and this impossibility is not simply ontological, it is politeconomic. And uh, only after I finished uh, my book, I came across a very strange document 
which is a letter of Ilyenkov to the Central Committee of Communist Party. Uh, allegedly, he wrote it in the beginning of 60s, and it's titled On the Position in Philosophy. And in this letter, it's a, it's a bit ironic and even funny, um, he writes directly to the representatives of government and Politburo and shares his worries about the insufficient influence of philosophy in Soviet society. In this letter, he urges, Ilyenkov urges the Central Committee to increase the influence of Marxist norms in philosophy uh, because to his mind, Marxist political economy should have a bigger impact on philosophy and vice versa. Socialist society should be more deeply permeated by philosophic uh, gnosiology, departing from the Marxist standpoint. So to a certain extent, this letter shows that uh, uh, he is even more radical than the Communist Party, which in comparison to him, in comparison to Ilyenkov's demands appears uh, a kind of liberal dissidents. Yet what is essential in this standpoint and what is the discovery of socialist philosophy and Ilyenkov per se is that Marxist political economy is not simply economic tool, but it unravels economic analysis as a field of philosophic gnosiology. Consequently, this leads to the main appeal of Ilyenkov, according to which socialist production, revolution, and political economy could become the polygon of philosophic speculation. And thus, the political economy is not simply the applied tools of social construction. So deprivatized economy can produce uh, the context to study dialectical convergence of thought and being, but as well to implement the dialectical convergence of thought and being. Um, thus, it is crucial that the ideal and the question about joining meta and mind is not simply the theoretical study, but it is a condition that is realizable politeconomically. And interestingly, uh, Groys, Boris Groys in his The Communist Postscript emphasizes precisely this nominal character of material culture of the um, Soviet um, Union, uh, claiming that what in capitalist conditions is an exchange in uh, uh, communist conditions becomes a linguistic, nominal, conceptual category. Uh, now another, um, another principal section of the book um, um, considers the libidinal components of economy and uh, derives from the broader analysis of surplus value in economy, in psychics and production. Uh, and many ask me, how come the issues of sexuality or libidinality are connected with the, either uh, the socialist context or emancipatory context or the context of um, metaphysical treatment of mind and matter. And I try uh, to explain this. So, um, surplus value uh, is seen uh, not merely as an economic factor, but as we see in research since Marx and in contemporary research and in psychoanalysis, it is intertwined with the phantasmatic and narcissistic aspects of capitalist production of desire. So surplus value is somehow linked with the production of desire. That's how we come to the subtitle of the book, Desire and Boredom in Soviet Socialism. If desire is something instigated by surplus value economics, so 
if we have surplus value in capitalism and if this surplus value is instigated by desire, then logically the eradication of surplus value in socialism would suppose circumcision of that desire. So if we simply cut surplus value, uh, we cut the libidinal parameters of production and we cut the necessity and um, some sort of emancipatory constructivism of desire, which is both creative, but at the same time can be, um, can be characteristic, characteristic for the capitalist production. Some would argue that even though the aspect of desire and the libidinality has been broadly debated in the critique of capitalism since 70s uh, in the works by Lyotard, Deleuze Guattari, uh, Lordon, uh, uh, pres at present uh, the issues of the libidinal context had been um, discussed by John Roberts, who is present with us, and his forthcoming book is also titled The Limitations of Capitalism uh, and Desire. Um, capitalism and the Limits of Desire. Uh, capitalism and Limits of Desire, it's the other way around. And uh, Samo Tomsic's Capitalist Unconscious. Still, um, many theorists argue that Marx did not dwell on the libidinal aspects of capitalist production, as he was much more focused on the issues of subsumption of living labor, correlation of production, pr productive forces and the relations of productions. This is definitely true, yet Marx dedicated special attention to commodity fetishism and the convertedness of forms in the commodity production which definitely resonates with the phantasmatic and tempting character inscribed in a commodity and inevitably hinges on the symbolic parameters of surplus value. Uh, for example, in the subchapter titled The Meaning of Human Requirements, where there is private property, in his The Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, Marx writes that production grounded in private property produces the urgency of need. By consequence, production starts to function in this case as the encourager of necessitated novelties and new enjoyments. And uh, Marx uses this lexicon. He uses the word urgency of need and he uses the word enjoyment. In this case, as Marx adds paradoxically, the growth of necessities simultaneously generates a lack of necessities. And this is uh, already a Lacanian dialectics of, of, of the drive and of lack. And in fact, this passage of Marx gives a formula of how private property actually generates uh, uh, the artificial no novelty, the converted form of of object, which is this necessitated novelty, uh, uh, which acquires uh, its forms of production via surplus value. And indeed, Marx doesn't use the lexicon of libidinal economy, yet this passage explicitly manifests that by determining private property as the urgency of need, Marx emphasizes quasi crypto libidinal character of capitalist production in which that very urgent need is in fact the surplus desire which eventually transforms itself into surplus value. So it is precisely in this uh, connection, dialectics of desire, surplus value, libidinality that the aspects of sexuality arise that the aspects of sexuality can be considered at all. Namely, I observe sexuality in its dependence on the production of desire and sexuality is seen as something that departs from the libidinal forms of economics and is declined in the conditions of the non-libidinal forms of economics. So again, sexuality becomes the operator to see the libidinal forms of economic production and non-libidinal socialist forms of economic production. And in, the, in this connection, I try to look at a few Soviet texts 
discussing the unimportance of enjoyment for socialist society and the texts which delink sexuality and its psychics and lexicons from biological sex, such as Voloshinov's Freudianism or Andrei Platonov's Antisexus and a few others. To conclude, uh, this is uh, my last paragraph. I would add that when I started working on this book, many aspects of it were met with fierce argument. For example, the notions of de-alienation or the issues of Marxist humanism or critique of techno-essentialism uh, or the um, emancipatory potential of basic need economy, critique of enjoyment, etc. All that was labeled as passé, as outdated, and as the creations of totalitarian society disguised into emancipatory narrative. But it is truly symbolic that during this pandemic, numerous appeals against capitalism stepped out of the idea of micro changes, of gradual imminent transformations, demanding those very drastic decisionist uh, measures, calling for precisely uh, 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 these acts of de-alienation, collapse of enjoyment and desire understood as emancipation and demanding even basic need uh, economy as we came across in recent texts by Zizek and Franco Berardi. Uh, I would add, and here, and um, thanks. It's exactly 30 minutes. Yes, uh, perfect timing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a number of uh, replies. Uh, Professor John Roberts, uh, uh, Professor Andrei Majdanski, uh, uh, Ilya Budraitsky, uh, who will be the first? It's up to you. I'll, I'll go first. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, Professor uh, John Roberts, uh, uh, Professor of Art and Aesthetics at the University of uh, Wolverhampton. Okay, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that um, Katie's book is extraordinarily impressive and important. And what I'd like to do this afternoon, UK time, is explain in some detail why that is the case. In fact, I don't think Ketty in her uh, introduction has actually done justice to the um, innovative qualities of her own work. So what I want to do uh, now um, is touch on some of those innovative qualities in the book and our writing generally. And I want to do this by concentrating on two things. The, the nature, the political, economic and social nature of the Soviet system and Ketty's account um, of, her account of post-capitalist emancipation based upon her reading of late Soviet experience. Okay, so there are three positions on the nature of the USSR. Um, and these three positions were developed largely in the 1940s and 1950s. The first is that the Soviet Union was in a transition state towards full communism. And that's the, the standard Stalinist or reform Stalinist position. Position two, that is Russian society was neither capitalist nor socialist although the forces of production continue to develop. This will not lead to communism, just as the continuing exploitation of workers will not lead to capitalism. St Stalinism, in fact, is a form of totalitarian barbarism suspended between capitalism and socialism. But this situation will be reversed. The bureaucratic depredations of the society will eventually lose their political character, releasing the non-repressive administrative capacities of the state in the struggle for a classless society. This, I mean, this theory of bureaucratic collectivism is identified with the writings of Max uh, Schachmann, as you may know. For Schachmann, workers under bureaucratic collectivism are not proletarians. 
even though they are exploited, they are rather slaves in as much as they are not free to sell their labor or bargain with their employer. Now, the third position, which is largely identifiable with the writings of Tony Cliff in the UK, is that Russia is state capitalist. Under socialism, the commodity form of wage labor continues and the competition between enterprises continues in response to the pressures of the world economy. Now, in Chakrov's book, Practicing the Good, she proposes a counter historical account of these debates based on a radical revision of position one, drawing on elements of position three. So Soviet communism's economic failure, that is, is increasing productive inefficiency and contraction in the 1960s and 1970s is paradoxically its strength. This rests on the system's post-capitalist realities, despite the system's residual state capitalist characteristics. Thus, the Chakrov, what the revolution produced despite Stalinism, and I quote from her here, is the criminalization, the criminalization of capitalist conditions. That is private property, surplus economy, fetishized consumption, and the aesthetics of libidinality that Ketty has talked about. This derives from the fact that under the Soviet system, the payment of wages was not subject to a process of surplus extraction, but part of a system of common wealth. So labor was not subject to privatized accumulation. Thus a basic need system came into being. Interestingly, Chakrov sees the greater achievement of the Soviet Union uh, in these terms, lying in its, in its mature phase and its, stagnant, um, <laughs> and its stagnant condition under the Brezhnev of years, rather than in the earlier utopic period. I quote again from her, Soviet society attained a non-capitalist condition only by the late 1950s. In this, she rehistoricizes um, re the communist experience in the Soviet Union. And, th and this is where her work is, is quite extraordinary and in innovative. Through an examination of how Soviet communism enacted an emancipatory critique of libidinal economy and the reduction of the conditions for what I call in, uh, in my new book that Katie has mentioned, non-repressive self-governance, non-repressive self-governance. Indeed, the underlying assumption of her argument is this, that given the ruling productivist paradigms on the anti-Stalinist left from the 1970s, sorry, from the 1950s to the late uh, 1980s, and you include those position, th three positions that I, I discussed at the beginning, there was a widespread failure to see how the intersection between the suppression of the co commodity form and the stagnant character of the Soviet economy, it opened up an unprecedented space free from the competitive logic and libidinal drives of capitalism, despite the low standard of living and continuing state repression. And in fact, one of the, the, maybe the book would not have got written in the form that it um, got written in. One of the strange um, characteristics of the book is the fact that um, although Ketty talks extensively about um, the ideal, idealization, and ideality. There's no uh, reference to, well, there's, there's very little reference to the counter reality of those three categories. There's um, no mention of the camps. Um, there's no mention of state repression. And there's no uh, mention of, of, of a, one might call a deep cultural conservatism, you know, through those uh, late mature years. Anyway, that's a topic for discussion at a later stage. So I'll pose a question. Is this model truly liberatory or is it a, a ratiocinative justification of widespread inertia and pacification as freedom from competition? From capitalist competition in those in those two decades. 
Because for, for Chakrov, our argument rests on the fact that it is not the Soviet Communist Party that ruled the USSR, but, and I quote again, the political, economic, and socio-ethical system and the infrastructure and epistemes generated through this system. Again, that's, I think, is, is an interesting topic for, for, for discussion. But this is a system, this is a philosophical system, and this ties into what um, Katia just said about the letter that Ilyankov um, wrote to the Central Committee. However, this is a system that the majority of citizens did not recognize or acknowledge. The implication being, therefore, that the Russian population for the last 20 years of the regime were in fact unconsciously participating in an experiment that they had no knowledge of or indeed little sympathy for. And in turn, the party only had a formal investment in. Okay, um, given this, I want to talk, um, I don't know, how long have I got? I mean, I, I have a... Um, um, so up to 10 minutes and uh, your time is almost up. So uh, two, uh, two more minutes. Okay, I just want to um, end my discussion uh, briefly about the debate uh, in her book around the productive forces and the relations of production, which I think is quite in, uh, in, important. In socialism, the productive forces lag behind the relations of production. Indeed, during the late Soviet period, they never achieved any correlation. The immature conditions of the productive forces were never able to fit with the demands of constructing an advanced socialist society and the emancipation of labor. As according to this position, only the development of the productive forces can secure the development of socialism and communism. Shukrov's counter-historical reading of the Soviet experiment refutes this um, attachment um, of socialism with the development of the reductive forces. Attaching an anti-libidinal account of the commonwealth produced by the Soviet common economy for use as a possible um, form of non-growth wealth, which of course is um, um, a debate that, um, that is very prevalent today, certainly through uh, ecological questions. This links her account notionally to the late Marx and his correspondence in the early 1880s with the Russian populists, in particular, very Zazulich, on the significance of the Russian peasant commune as a possible post-capitalist form of social organization. For Marx, the primitive commune dialectically restored on a higher technological, or, for Marx, the primitive commune dialectically restored on a higher technological and technical level is a way of avoiding the huge social and political costs of forced progress and industrialization. In this, Marx argued that there was no fatal necessity for the commune form to be destroyed by industrial capital. Advanced technology could be put to new uses under the control of the commune. Um, so I'm going to come to my uh, final remarks now. Then. So we might ask then, in the light of Marx's uh, last writing, was Marx then a Promethean or a Soterian? Soteria was, as you may know, was the Greek goddess of, of safe, safety and preservation. And Soterians uh, tend to identify certain human technological relations um, with um, regulatory restraints and, and certain technological re 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 relinquishments. So I asked, I asked then, is Chuck Chukrov's reading of the late Soviet experience through a critique of libidinal economy, Soterian. That is, is it opposed, in her view, to um, the, the rise of a number of Promethean and techno-optimistic positions today. So finally, is Soterianism, which I identify uh, in Katie's position, identifiable with this new post-growth politics? Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, how shall we proceed? Uh, Katie, would you like to give a, a quick uh, reply to this comment or you will uh, give a, a general reply to ask, all the comments uh, at the end? I will uh, answer afterwards, uh, otherwise it will be longer. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, then uh, 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 Andrei Majdanski uh, or Ilya Budraevsky. Uh, so... uh, can, can I be uh, first? Surely. Please go ahead. Uh, Ilya Budraitsky is a uh, political and cultural writer. He is currently teaches in Moscow School of Social, for Social and Economic Sciences and in the School of Design uh, at HSE and uh, at uh, ICA Moscow. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, uh, uh, I, I will try to be uh, short as uh, there are some more speakers, but uh, the first thing to say uh, that the the very project of uh, uh, the very framework of Katie's uh, book is uh, is very impressive uh, and very promising. Um, she, uh, as I underst understood her uh, her main point, her main ambition, uh, she um, uh, she is trying to. Uh, present the Soviet uh, reality, the um, the Soviet society, as uh, something uh, something unique, as a unique experience, uh, but uh, in the same time, uh, not a kind of project that uh, means a kind of uh, totality. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, uh, she, uh, on one hand, uh, opposed the uh, quite widespread uh, idea of the, let's say, opposition of the different elements of the Soviet history of the Soviet experience to each other, like uh, we had uh, good uh, 20s and bad uh, Stalinism, or uh, we, we, uh, we had uh, the uh, rise of the Soviet uh, project in the, in the beginning and the degradation uh, in the uh, latest decades, uh, but uh, Katie, uh, Katie is trying to present this experience as, uh, as, as unique. And in this sense, uh, this unique experience, uh, as I understood her, uh, her point, is, uh, is not a kind of uh, total. So it, it means that uh, there are certain uh, contradictions in this uh, experience. Uh, which are uh, which are very uh, special to uh, and very re related to its core, and in this sense, they are different uh, from the uh, contradictions uh, in the um, uh, capitalist society. And uh, in this sense, uh, it's uh, uh, it's very much related to the uh, approach, for example, proposed by the uh, late. Uh, Jörg Lukács in his uh, famous essay on uh, socialist realism, where he said that probably the best, uh, the best uh, example of how socialist realism uh, should be implemented is Alexander Solzhenitsyn's One Day of Ivan Denisovich, because it refers to uh, contradictions uh, and the real conditions of, uh, of the socialist uh, society and uh, the main question, uh, the main contradiction of, of this uh, society is, uh, is a moral contradiction, is a moral question, which is, uh, uh, which is different uh, from the, uh, let's say, social economic uh, contradictions in a, uh, in a capitalist society. Uh, so uh, here, I, I think uh, there is a, a difference uh, between uh, Katie's approach and Boris Groy's approach, uh, because on one hand uh, you can see some similarities, some clear um, clear ties between uh, between them. Like for Groy's and his uh, uh, communist postscriptum, uh, he uh, basically propose uh, the uh, the approach uh, that the Soviet uh, experience uh, was a, a direct implementation of the philosophy to a material praxis. So it was a philosophy in action, and uh, Katie uh, shared this uh, this um, uh, this view, but um, uh, she tried to. Uh, not to present, um, uh, not to present the Soviet experience as a totality, uh, as a, a pure, um, uh, the, the the pure uh, power of the language, 
uh, under their material uh, reality. And uh, in this sense, it's, uh, it's very interesting that she try, uh, she's trying to contextualize uh, her uh, analysis of the Soviet with the uh, Western uh, leftist and anti-capitalist uh, critics of, uh, of, of, of the 60s, uh, which uh, was mostly uh, based on the idea that, uh, as Adorno uh, pointed out, uh, when uh, philosophy already lost its uh, chance to be implemented in material reality. So uh, the Soviet experience was a kind of the chance of this implementation. And we, uh, we should uh, take uh, this chance, this uh, experience of this concrete implementation of the, um, uh, of the philosophies, something very, uh, very important, very valid for, uh, for our further anti-capitalist uh, critics of, uh, of the day. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this uh, Katie's framework is uh, is very rich and very uh, promising, and uh, she uh, uh, she actually uh, explains uh, how uh, this. Uh, optics uh, could uh, could work on some concrete uh, fields like uh, uh, like the Soviet cinema or Soviet literature, uh, etc. So uh, I, I I have uh, basically uh, three uh, like questions uh, to Katie. Uh, so uh, the first one is. Um, the question about the very category of uh, socialism, uh, which uh, uh, which is widely used in, in, in her book uh, as a kind of syn a synonym uh, of the Soviet reality itself. So uh, we know that the idea that uh, the uh, Soviet uh, reality was a direct implementation of some kind of uh, socialism as the, as the let's say, uh, uh, social form uh, came from the uh, official Soviet ideology. So we uh, couldn't find the, I, uh, the definition of what is the uh, socialism, which is different from, uh, from communism uh, in uh, Marx or Lenin or other uh, classic uh, uh, Marxist uh, writers. So uh, uh, for the initial approach of, uh, of Marx and Lenin, uh, we, uh, we mainly get the idea of the worker state as a kind of transitionary form. Uh, and socialism is, uh, is a kind of uh, essential form. So it's not a kind of transition, but it's a definition of uh, uh, um, something already existed. And in this uh, sense, I, I will uh, share the, uh, the previous comment by uh, John Roberts, uh, where, uh, where he um, uh, compare it with uh, Schachmann or uh, Tony Cleave's approach uh, who uh, that proposed some concrete definitions for uh, for um, for that experience instead of uh, uh, talking about it as a just a kind of transition from uh, from the capitalism to uh, to communism so uh, my question is uh, what is the socialism <laughs> how uh, she can uh, she can deal with all these uh, difficulties about this uh, uh, definition the second uh, point is uh, uh, more specific is um, uh, is about uh, Katie's uh, approach to Marx's uh, legacy, because uh, she mostly uh, used Marx's uh, concept of uh, alienation from uh, from the uh, economic philosophical uh, manuscript, the earlier works of uh, Marx, uh, but uh, the uh, all the criticism of uh, ideology, commodity fetishism, and so on um, uh, came uh, not. From the early marks, but uh, from uh, from capital, and that uh, what uh, was uh, basically the main uh, point of uh, famous Althusserian episti uh, uh, epistemological gap in between the early and uh, later uh, later marks. So why um, uh, why uh, Katie uh, took uh, this early um, uh, let's say Marxist humanist uh, Hegelian 
uh, notion of uh, alienation instead of uh, of the method of capital, which is uh, basically uh, have a lot of uh, differences and uh, which could be in some sense more uh, productive and more relevant in this uh, uh, framework of uh, of your uh, research about the uh, Western uh, anti-capitalist uh, uh, criticism of the uh, 60s, 70s, um, and so on. And the third question is uh, is a bit of provocative, but I think is uh, is very important <laughs> because uh, if we uh, took um, uh, Boris Groys. Uh, approach to the Soviet from his uh, communist postscriptum, uh, we can uh, describe it uh, as a kind of uh, distant irony uh, towards the Soviet experience. So Groys uh, definitely uh, doesn't associate himself with this uh, experience and uh, he distantly like makes some uh, some intellectual uh, uh, points and games around this uh, reflection of, of this experience. But uh, it seems that the position of uh, Katie used to be a bit uh, different. So where, uh, where uh, you, <laughs> Katie, uh, are uh, positioning yourself towards the uh, um, Soviet experience uh, for the moment. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, next uh, comment uh, by Andrei uh, Maidansky, professor uh, in philosophy at Belgrade National Research University and associate researcher at the Uni Institute of Philosophy, Russian Academy of Science. Please go ahead. Автора Кэти с этой замечательной книгой бросается в глаза уже ее внешность, я имею в виду книгу, а, конечно, и э, эта обложка такая авангардистская, да, с рекомендациями, очень солидными рекомендациями Корифея в обороте. Вот, я лично вот что увидел в этой книге, об этом отчасти уже сама Кэти сказала, э, это... Результат такого процесса дистилляции советской философской мысли. Мало что от нее осталось за 30 лет, вот пока шел этот процесс дистилляции. И это то, что вот осталось, мы можем видеть в книгах новых, которые сейчас выходят, книги Кэти. Да, это такой как сорт бренди выдержанный. Сказать, вот в контекстах, как она говорит, или в дубовых бочках таких лакана, березового карили, атара, жижика. Вот. Но это не только бочки постмодерна, это и Адорна, и Лукач. То есть такая западная неомарксистская традиция, которая, конечно, родственна по духу, более родственна по духу главным советским персонажам книги Ильенкову, Выгодскому и Липшицу. Вот, я не могу не одобрить очень-очень горячо выбор Кэти, ее вкус, потому что эти три имени, как уже сейчас достаточно прояснилось, и есть то ценное, что советский марксизм оставил наследство мировому духу, так сказать. Остальное в процессе дистилляции испарилось, было списано в уйти, но остались какие-то, может, следы незначительные, сравнительно, а вот эти трое остались. И сегодня их труды издаются, обсуждаются, причем по восходящей, набирая обороты, издаются архивные вещи. Вот только что вышла новая, значит, новые тексты Лившица. Сегодня на выставке книжные они были. Немало интересного. То, что авторы не могли напечатать при жизни. И мне близка базисная мысль, которая в книге Кэти. Значит, звучит, что социализмы вот эти 20 века и советский социализм в частности, вот как и искусство авангарда, они насквозь пропитаны духом капитализма. И самая радикальная критика капитализма не столько отрицает, сколько доводит до предела, иногда до гротеска внутренняя тенденция этого вот строя жизни буржуазного, как говорят, или порожденного частной собственностью. Когда-то подобную мысль высказал Маркс, 
с молодой мая в 1944 году он писал, что коммунизм в его первой форме является лишь обобщением и завершением отношений частной собственности. И вот то, что мы знаем под именем Советский Союз, это и есть коммунизм в его первой форме. В этой форме, пишет Марс, он выступает как всеобщая частная собственность. Грубый коммунизм, пишет он, есть только форма проявления гнусности частной собственности, желающей утвердить себя в качестве положительной общности. Ну вот то, что Маркс писал о коммунистических теориях до да, своего времени, Кетти уже знает и пишет о практиках социализма, вот, который, в общем, и есть этот грубый коммунизм, перекочевавший из книжек в жизнь. Кетти анализирует свершившийся исторический опыт. Но в основном не напрямую, как это делают историки или экономист, хотя в книге есть моменты, значит, об экономике тоже говорится. Вот, но в основном она изучает такие отражения этого советского опыта в зеркалах искусства, философии, сексуальности. Вот, кстати, Маркс, как мы помним, утверждал, что отношение к женщине вообще выдает тайну коммунизма и именно по отношению к женщине лучше всего судить о ступени общей культуры человека. Это цитата. Вот, и в этом смысле ну, вот, Кэти, как бы подхватывает, разрабатывает, развивает, не, не всегда ссылаясь, хотя о Марксе достаточно много говорится, вот эти так сказать, ранние, ранние ценные такие мысли Маркса. Ну, мне показалась также интересная мысль, Кэти, что я процитирую, модернистское и авангардистское отрицание культуры может рассматриваться как решение наказать себя, to self-punch, за атрофию культуры. Авангардизм – это такое культурное садомазо. Да? Мне кажется, Лившицу тоже понравилась бы эта метафора. Ну и как человек, скормленный текстами Ильенкова, я хотел бы особо поблагодарить Кети за две главы об Иваде Васильевиче, в частности, за космологический гуманизм, о котором мало что, ну, это такое, собственно, авторское название, о котором мало что известно на Западе, да и у нас не очень-то люди знают. Да? А ведь это такая в эстетическом, по крайней мере, плане очень мощная, впечатляющая вещь, высшая эсхатология, которая не пессимистична если цитировать Кетти. Значит, это очень верная оценка. Вот недавно Жижик тоже у нас написал про космологию духа, но гораздо слабее. Значит, и вообще как-то не очень вразумительно, я бы сказал. Вот Кетти передала основные идеи этой работы. И, значит, учитывая, что недавно вышел английский перевод космологии духа и немецкий, кстати, Борис Гройс как раз его издал. А вот, ну, все это очень хорошо и способствует ну, того, что этот железный занавес, который мешал Ленкову по многим позициям высказываться и не позволил даже опубликовать космологию духа. Вот он сейчас усилиями вот таких авторов, как Кетти, он поднимается, наконец, с некоторым опозданием, но, тем не менее, эти замечательные, на мой взгляд, вещи становятся доступны для западного читателя. Причем доступны не просто, так сказать, в виде пересказа. Да? Ну, это была ценность пересказа, она, как говорится, тоже имеет место быть. Вот. Но здесь Ильенко, он вовлекается в такой диалог, да? в диалог с западными, современными западными мыслителями. Вот. Иногда в противостоянии там, со спекулятивным реализмом, иногда так сказать, вот, в просто перекличку с идеями какими-то западными, дереза. Вот. И ну, это самый короткий, на мой взгляд, путь к уму западного читателя. И в этом смысле стратегия Кети очень эффективна. И в этом заключается и главная польза, на мой взгляд. Книги польза в том, что выстраивается такой мост, осуществляется связь, живая связь между лучшими идеями советских марксистов и современностью, современной философией, социальными практиками, разными культурными течениями. 
Потому что без такой связи самая ценная мысль, она превращается ну, в такой музейный экспонат. В лучшем случае музейный экспонат, а в худшем просто забывается. Вот. Самая лучшая память – это когда идеи работают, работают в современной культуре. И вот это, я считаю, в этом заключается ценность книги, которую мы сегодня обсуждаем. Спасибо за внимание. Очень, да, очень рад выходу этой книги. Uh, thank you, and we have uh, one more uh, comment uh, by Professor uh, uh, Sorin Chaikov. I don't know if he's uh, online with us or not, if he's ready. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, th 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 thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Nikolai Sorin Chaikov, uh, uh, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the High School of Economics uh, in St. Petersburg, please. Mm. Yes, I, I wonder if you could actually let me share my screen because I actually have uh, typed up my comments. So I'm gonna... uh, absolutely, I can. Just a moment. Um, just a moment. Yes, I did. Fantastic. All right. Brilliant. Um... So let me just go. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, so my questions are going to be anthropological, that is, um, uh, the ones that are made from the point of view of the, uh, when philosophy becomes social theory and then it in turn is open to ethnography, that is concrete, specific research, um, in this case ethnography and history of Soviet socialism. So I'd like to second Ilya Bodraitsky's question. It's not very clear what Katie means by socialism. So it'd be something interesting to explore, to ask her, to elaborate. I don't agree um, uh, with uh, John Roberts on where's the, where are the camps. Um, and I think uh, um, the previous commentator already made this point that actually where's any kind of Soviet reality, desires, economies, idea, ideas about what is good, um, any culture in the anthropological sense of the word. So of course, it's, um, the book is not about that. Just to give a very brief example, something that I'm exploring, if you take um, this portrait of Lenin, which was made in the late 1920s, Art of Human Hair, by a hairdresser who um, uh, gave it as a gift to the newly established um, Museum of Lenin. So he, uh, and this is also a nod to some of the Moscow conceptualism, uh, which as um, uh, Boris Groys wants to approach from the point of the ready-made kind of Soviet objects, but actually also never quite getting to the actually ready-made Soviet objects. So uh, this is a, a gift to, to the Lenin Museum from someone who accompanies it with an enormous letter, very long letter, uh, asking, basically saying that for, in, in exchange for these gifts, I, I want, and he has the whole list of things, he wants uh, a new flat in, a, uh, on the house in, uh, in the house of the, on the embankment, he wants a job in the Kremlin, etc., etc. So of course he never gets it, precisely because he desires it so much. And it's a wrong thing to do to express such desires together with this kind of gift giving. So this is as far as the kind of Soviet reality is concerned, and as far as the actual desires and uh, commodities, objects, material uh, goods, and things that were circulating in Soviet society. Um, but that's, that's again, as, as I say, it's not really the point of the book. I take it to be something else altogether. Uh, and I don't think it's actually, it's also a problem to deploy theory in uh, research work and publications, perhaps a little bit, it's a problem in a kind of area studies journals, but that's pre precisely because they're kind of a, a theoretical um, uh, by default, if you like. Um, but I think it's the problem is uh, more of a problem uh, than that would be to um, deprovincialize theory, uh, which I think Ketty's work does very brilliantly um, which reveals uh, what we take often take for granted is basically uh, Western hegemony, of uh, Western conceptual hegemony. So, so I really appreciate that, and uh, so the comments that I, and the questions that I have are really kind of a clarification. I'd really like to use the opportunity for Katie to explain a little bit more. Uh, for example, to draw um, my question one, I have like three questions or points 
uh, question one would be to uh, elaborate the comparison between Ilyenkov and Althusser, and perhaps also Godelier, to whom uh, Katie refers in her work. So, of course, it's um, uh, interesting to bounce the two ideas against one another, uh, thinking how the concept of idea in Ilyenkov uh, works in parallel or in contrast with the um, concept of uh, ideology um, and in Althusser and in the kind of revisions of, uh, of, um, of Marx, uh, despite all the kind of the um, uh, points that Ilya made about the, the kind of like, which Marx are we talking about here? It's actually really interesting that what um, Katie charts is the um, two parallel processes. There's on the one hand, a, uh, um, um, a development of less materialist, if you like, perspective within Western critical theory, particularly exemplified by Althusser's treatment of ideology. Um, and there's a very interesting parallel um, development of the thinking about ideas. So I'd like to perhaps, uh, Katie, spend a little bit more time explicitly comparing and contrasting uh, the, um, these, two, um, uh, these two authors on that front. Um, um, uh, I th don't think actually my... Uh, I don't think my um, uh, presentation is now moving, so I'll have to finish it without uh, turning my slides um, anyway. But uh, my second question that I wanted to put to Katie is basically to talk a little bit about people who are not in the book. In particular, I thought of the, uh, it would be really interesting to um, compare the um, methodology of not just Ilyenkov, uh, but also of Vladimir Bibler, uh, who was another very important philosopher and who also developed a very interesting concept which runs parallel to the discussion of alienation, but actually it stems from the positioning um, axiomatic foundations of knowledge and the categorical imperative as not simply something which is taken for granted within a system of thought, but actually as the other within a given tradition of thought. So from that point of view, uh, the view, the process of um, materialization that uh, Ket is describing, drawing on uh, Ilyenkov as a, and his example of the jar, which kind of embodies the whole previous history. I think if you look at Bibla, then it, it, it becomes not necessarily accumulation, but internal othering. Um, and he applies that specifically to the, uh, uh, to thinking about uh, how we can actually think about the history of philosophy and history of science as a constant production of internal otherness within uh, its own conceptual thought. So that would be quite an interesting parallel. And my final um, point with which I wanted to also show a couple of other examples, but since my, my slides don't move, I, you'll have to um, uh, live with the just one, the first uh, illustration that I've demonstrated, which was this portrait of Lenin made of human hair. And I would like to just draw attention to the fact that uh, this isn't just Marxism in Ilyenkov's in Ilyenko sense or in Bibler's sense or in all the senses of other philosophers that we mentioned today, both Russian and Western, but also there's, there's such a thing as um, what uh, I, as well as Anna Kroglova, who I think is in the audience, uh, called vernacular Marxism, which is basically everyday Marxist imagination, which is done very much in the form of, for example, gifts like these. Um, and I think this is a very good example of, on the one hand, what uh, Ketty is talking about, such as the, the way Soviet reality produced this kind of ready-made ready uh, conceptual objects, uh, but I don't think neither uh, Boris Groys himself, uh, nor I'm afraid probably Ketty in, in this particular work goes far enough to uh, conceptualize these kind of practices. So I think these three questions would one clarification on Ilyenkov versus Althusser, the other one for the possible place of Bibla in this, and the third about Marxism and vernacular Marxism. These would be my questions for discussion for today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, John, Andrei, Ilya, Nikolai. 
a really excellent question. And uh, I'm really honored uh, for the fact that such a conspicuous thinkers just uh, dedicated time to this book. So I'm extremely, extremely and deeply grateful. Um, well, I, I start with John's question and the main question, uh, 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 which was really crucial. Um, liberation from competitive logic uh, due to um, non-growth um, development of economy uh, and lagging behind of productive forces. Yes, uh, truly, th this is an important thing, but I think that I didn't develop it sufficiently because this would entail the analysis of technology. Uh, and the role of technology, uh, which was extremely important in the beginning of avant-garde, but, but, but which declined and shifted only to military uh, domain, but it did not develop in uh, retail goods, consumption traditions, and uh, gradually was becoming uh, uh, less and less uh, efficient so that, um, Soviet lifestyle uh, looked like equality in poverty, equality in squalor to a certain extent. And I even use this word squalor. Uh, but then my argument is uh, if there is no surplus value, and I just follow John's comment, if, if there is no surplus value and no desire and no striving and excess of acceleration and no Promethean productivism, uh, then uh, probably there is this inevitable uh, fall into the stagnation that uh, paradoxically, we cannot answer this question because we do not know other variants of socialism. Uh, we do not know the proper Marxist way of socialism, and we do not know whether the proper Marxist uh, mo mode of socialism would bring to the same result. So this was uh, a rhetorical and regulative question, whether the uh, sequestering and cutting of surplus and of desire and of libidinality will bring production to this uh, squalid forms of um, uh, material culture. So probably I would agree uh, uh, when John makes this differentiation between Promethean techno-optimism and uh, satirian. Satirianism. Uh, 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 Satirianism. Sorry? Satirianism. Satirianism with this post-growth politics. Uh, well, it's not that I'm choosing it each of these as an ideology, but uh, it's just constatation uh, of the symptoms of the sociality or which made this choice in favor of distributive economy, uh, thus um, somehow petrifying uh, movement and petrifying uh, speeds uh, of uh, development. Although the word uskarenie, speed, was very important in Soviet 50s and uh, 60s. But this was much more um, connected with the um, cosmic developments, military developments, and more a metaphoric mythology. The daily life did not look accelerated, I would say, in the socialist context. On the contrary, one would compare the temporality of, <laughs> of socialism with some kind of arrested uh, eternity. Um, uh, so, so, so really valuable observations about uh, uh, freedom from competitive lo logic. Um, and uh, another point concerning John's uh, comments about infrastructure uh, which is ruling much more than the party itself. Uh, yes, uh, a very precise observation uh, because uh, uh, um, 
you also mentioned people who were not aware what experiment they are participating in, in uh, exactly because infrastructure was smarter and uh, already uh, organized uh, uh, as, the, as the Marxist algorithm so that uh, as the communist algorithm so that uh, could I, could I say something there? Could we say then, just as the productive forces lagged behind the relations of production, um, we, well, we might say that the, the party um, um, lagged behind the communist ideal. Absolutely, yes. This, this was my point that the ru ruling point is the communist idea and the party has to adhere to it. It has to squeeze itself and uh, to attain this uh, validity of, of the communist idea. So infrastructure is more communist than the daily life. And therefore, my point was, which I did not somehow articulate uh, initially, that uh, the Soviet Union decomposed not because of lack of socialism or lack of communism, but it had too much communism, which was unbearable for the daily conditions. So infrastructure was more rigid and more ideal than the possibility to uh, adhere and implement it. Um, now I would uh, shift to... Um, Ilya's questions, three questions. What is socialism? Yes, absolutely true, because this is the point of Balibar when he says that there is no autonomous socialism, it's just transition from uh, capitalism to communism, and therefore socialist state is not valid because a struggle within capitalism is much more communism than this absolutely autonomized uh, socialist state, uh, which uh, can only be a transitory passage. But um, uh, there is also a remark of Engels, which I'm bringing, I forgot uh, where from, when he's saying that socialism is also some kind of experimental rehearsal. It's, it's like scientific rehearsal. So in this sense, uh, I would rather take socialism not as transition from one, uh, for formation to another social formation, but rather as experimental rehearsal. And in, in terms of rehearsal, I would think that, uh, I think that the, uh, the personalia uh, with around revolution and around third international were aware that this was a rehearsal. They, they, they would not be stupid enough to think that this is a totally uh, established uh, state. Um, so um, here, I think it's just uh, aberration uh, because nobody would say that socialism is an established state, but we have to deal with the historical uh, conditions of it and the productive conditions of this formation because they, they existed and we have to analyze them. Uh, so about Marx, yes, this is a drawback, I agree. Uh, I had to inscribe the later uh, period of capital, but I, don't, uh, but I don't think that interpretation of alienation would uh, differ much. I think this is much more Althusser's decision to, because Althusser, Althusser had to delineate himself from this uh, optimistic early Marxism with these humanist uh, ideas, uh, because he had to deal with the society in which this cannot be implemented, and, the, uh, and hence the sociality is negatively marked, and therefore uh, capital is uh, predominantly the analysis, and it doesn't give this um, pacified uh, images of already achieved communism or through the change of human nature, etc. of course. Uh, but still, uh, if you take Grundrisse, for instance, which is already 50s, um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that the 
um, the way uh, Marx discusses uh, alienation or labor is ideologically different from early Marx. Of course, Marx becomes a virtuoso of economic analysis uh, already in 50s and in 40s, he does not master this virtuoso analysis, uh, but still I don't think there is a political or ideological uh, gap um, between uh, these two. Uh, but truly, truly, I, uh, I had to have more uh, references to the later Marx and distant irony of Groys. Well, I didn't take this book as irony. Uh, uh, for me, uh, communist post postscript was rather uh, delinea uh, de delineation of the uh, socialist experience, experience as untranslatable into the languages and semiology of the of the of the anti-capitalist leftism because i think what groys was uh, criticizing was the anti-capitalist leftism within capitalism by the way today i was at the debate at the electro theater and the debate was about leftism in new theater uh, and you wouldn't imagine that all um, new drama writers deal with Latour, Donna Haraway. So this theory is um, uh, like squeezing and coming more and more uh, in, in, in the Russian context. And I just asked the question uh, for, uh, this, for the students and the students are answering that for them, the leftist theory is simply the capacity to criticize something and the capacity to acquire certain liber liberation and rights. But when I asked whether leftism for them is about anti-capitalism, even not that. So anti-capitalism for them would be something radical and uh, absolutely not politically correct. Uh, therefore, uh, in, uh, I think Gross's critique was uh, criticizing soft emancipation as against hard emancipation, uh, showing communism as uh, hard emancipation. So if we were to apply this uh, terminology. And um, uh, um, Andrei Maidansky's um, question, yes, about eschatology was important, uh, cosmology uh, in, in the work by Ilyenkov and his Cosmologia uh, Ducha, Cosmology of Spirit. Uh, this is a fantastic work. Everyone who reads it um, uh, is uh, totally mind, bl mind blown, can I say so? Um, and I would mention two interpretations of this piece. John, you remember when we were at the seminar in Berlin and we were discussing this piece and my German colleagues, um, uh, they were absolutely, mm, they were very unhappy with this text because they said that Ilyenkov's text is so pathetic, it's so metaphysical and it does not show the differences. So this text is absolutely uh, manifesting communist absolutism. And this absolutism is uh, really important, but I don't think that it's totalitarian. Uh, uh, whereas for com contemporary theory, which cannot apply emancipatory uh, um, uh, terms without tradition of dif difference, differencing, differentiation, um, it cannot see gender difference, it cannot see racial difference, it cannot see various south, east, north uh, differentiations. Therefore, such text that only applies certain uh, common cause uh, is hostile for them and not understandable as uh, something that posits emancipation. This was very interesting. Whereas my Russian students who read uh, the same text, they said, oh, it's so good. It's so metaphysical. Thank God it's not truly Marxist. So <laughs> you can imagine that both for the uh, leftist uh, Western appraisal, it is not sufficiently Marxist, but for the non-leftist uh, um, Russian liberal students who 
expect something religious, mystical, because they are interested in this um, post-rational new materialisms and mystified conditions of um, uh, artistic uh, practices, this text uh, really applies to them. So um, those who need emancipation in contemporary terms, they did not take it as emancipation. And those who need something mystical, they really took it for, I don't know, their own um, symbolic credo. And this is quite uh, paradoxic uh, for me. And I tried to explain that this eschatological motive is not religious, on the contrary, it's extremely secular and it's uh, extremely Marxist. And Nikolai's questions, uh, yes, um, uh, about Althusser, how we would connect ideology of Althusser and the idea or the ideal of Ilyenkov. I think there is definitely a divergence here because uh, ideology uh, as well as power for Foucault as well as apparatuses for him, uh, they are marked negatively. So they are ambivalent. And I try to show this in my book that they are some sort of Möbius. They, they, they work in Möbius logic. They um, uh, confirm something, they affirm something by negating. And the more they claim something as negative, the more it is uh, applied as emancipatory. Uh, the more subject is subjugation, uh, uh, the more subjugation um, is important to construct subjectivity and, and therefore negativity is inscribed into sociality. Sociality uh, cannot do without subjugation. In, 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 uh, in this Marxist context where it is impossible to imagine the completely emancipated society, it is important to live with this negativity, to live with this Möbius ambivalent logic uh, when power is everywhere, uh, or, but uh, then we have to um, invent differentiations within power and some logics of subversion uh, within power, within order, within law. Um, uh, uh, whereas the idea of um, uh, Ilyenkov is, uh, um, is a very optimistic notion in terms of uh, it really evolves itself in some kind of sociality which has accomplished its purification from capitalist logic, from the, from the logic when you, you shouldn't be afraid that power will be capitalist power, that order will be capitalist order or exploiting order. So all those notions which are holistic notions, they cannot be claimed in capitalist conditions as affirmative. Whereas Ilyenko shows that this affirmation might be possible in case you devoid society uh, from the symptoms that uh, instigate uh, subjugation. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe this is truly idealist, but uh, that uh, the thinkers of Marxism were believing in it and were uh, truly constructing epist epistemology on this new post-revolutionary or post-capitalist context. This is absolutely evident. This you can see in, in the works of Vygotsky as well, or uh, in the works of uh, another psychologist, uh, Leontiev. And uh, another question of Nikolai about uh, uh, Bibler. Uh, I, I didn't know Bibler deeply. I just looked through and I was amazed how many affinities there are and how, um, how closely they were inscribed into Hegelian tradition and Hegelian understanding of what is universal and uh, interpreting culture as something universal. Uh, it can be in dialogue, but it's not multiculturalism. At the same time, you come across there um, the notions 
similar to Ilyenkov, which is всеобщее, which is the general. Uh, but also uh, this idea of uh, othering within culture, which is Hegelian undersign. And uh, Andrei Maidansky was the first person who showed uh, how Hegelian undersign works in Ilyenkov, and I borrowed this <clears throat> from him. So truly, uh, <clears throat> Ilyenkov also has this technique of othering constantly because uh, universality is impossible without uh, in a butier, othering, the capacity of each objecthood or each thing to be constantly in uh, um, in, in other hypostases. Uh, and, and this makes dialectical, uh, dialectical fusion and dialectical procedure possible. Whereas if you have the aggregation, for instance, in actor network theory, you should only have the par particles, the selves, the selves which are nominal selves, absolutely immanent selves and absolutely literal sel selves, which aggregate performatively but they don't need this um, uh, fusion, they don't need this becoming, they don't need uh, this accumulative uh, process of uh, becoming the other and growing into the other, which, which of course is Marxist and which is Hegelian. Uh, uh, and uh, concerning Baudelier, um, I'm not a big specialist in it, but uh, what was interesting uh, is, and what, what, what Ilyenkov has uh, uh, also in terms of affinity with Godelier is, uh, of course, this idea that the relations of production can affect back the productive forces. This I first um, came across in, in the abstract and concrete in, Ilya, in, in Ilyenkov's work, and I came across this idea that uh, somehow uh, relations of production can conversely, can, can somehow reverse their impact on productive uh, forces and on the technique and on uh, infrastructure. Uh, rather than this classical Marxist idea that productive forces are stronger in their affectation and influence on um, sociality. So the, the basis is, is much more important to affect the, the superstructure. But Godelier shows that superstructure can affect back the basis and Ilyenkov also uh, has this idea. Just to answer short and give the floor to other questions, and uh, I shut up here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, are we ready to take questions from the audience? Uh, uh, or, or there will be any follow-ups for, from our uh, commentators? Uh, it's up to you. <laughs> Uh, okay then. Uh, 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 so, um, uh, dear, dear friends, uh, uh, so you can now ask your questions, uh, uh, and I will repeat the same in Russian. Uh, дорогие друзья, сейчас, пожалуйста, самое время задать ваши вопросы. Кэти, uh, у нас еще остается некоторое время. Мы uh, ориентировочно заканчиваем в восемь, но в принципе, конечно, можно оставить просто конференцию работающую для выяснения каких-то uh, вопросов, которые вас очень волнуют. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, vernacular Marxist. Uh, yes, um, Nikolai's question about vernacular Marx. Yes, this is a great, uh, great research of yours. I was really uh, impressed and I only touched upon it in terms of uh, uh, conceptuality of the material uh, material culture of the Soviet context because it is so ideologized. The idea is so much uh, it, it is per is permeating the daily life so much that it becomes uh, uh, conceptual in a, in unmediated way. So uh, it is vernacularly Marxist and vernacularly conceptual. Um, 
and and this I, I I would only agree with this uh, vernacular Marxism, but I think it's uh, mm, it it has more um, um, it has more the interest of collector. So you are right; it has this ethnographic element, and I think I study this element of idea present in daily. Uh, materiality through logical issues, uh, through, through logical analysis of Ilyenkov's mind and body uh, uh, dialectics. Can, Tasha, I, can, you work? can I ask a, um, a question? Yes, please. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, um, I think this is quite an important question. Um, I want to reflect on some of the things that you say right at the end of the book where you, uh, you mentioned this in passing actually, um, you, you talk about um, the boredom and hardship involved in the struggle for communism, which is a very different kind of um, transformative epistemology than we um, usually expect from um, emancipatory discourse. That is where communism today with a small c is spoken of. It's usually talked about in relation to multiplicity, plenty potentiality, um, and the uh, the release of difference. Could you talk? Could you talk um, a little bit about that distinction, please? Uh, so why communism is boredom, and and how come I dare to call communism boredom? And no, I I, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm not. No, uh, I'm, uh, no, not saying no, that I, you are. That's a dare. Um, but it, your your understanding of communism with a small c through your critique of libidinal economy leads you to talk about. Uh, boredom and hardship mm. instead of plenipotentiality, multiplicity, indifference. Mm. Yeah, but um, um, well, I, I think that uh, when I uh, used this word boredom, I meant uh, impossibility to digest the necessities of communism. So, impossibility to digest uh, this non libidinal. Uh, uh, basic need economy, uh, which was the fate, the fatality of, of this kind of sociality, uh, uh, bringing it to decomposition, because uh, without desire, uh, the, the production and productive forces, they decompose. But boredom was much more a metaphor than something that we have to aspire for as, as the model of emancipation. It's more like question that um, how can we <coughs> how can we imagine communism uh, uh, which has to be based and uh, organized as equality and uh, if equality presupposes uh, radical um, eradication of a certain certain elements, coercive criminalization of private property, of imaginary forms. I mean, everybody talks against Marx when they um, when they emphasize that Marxist rigidity would imply um, eradication of this imaginary richness of creativity, of desire, of libidinality. Castoriadis calls, uh, talks about them. Even, um, uh, well, Leotard talks about them. All the uh, uh, theorists of 60s emphasize that. Karl Polanyi emphasizes that um, Marxist economism is very rigid and he extrapolates um, capitalist, uh, the logic of capitalist society on the previous societies and all, on all other societies. So in this sense, uh, even in Marx, if we implement what Marx is demanding from us, like uh, live with the interests of another person, oh, this will be boring. I mean, for a capitalist subject, it is boring, but for an ideal communist subject, this is bliss. This is the point. 
I know, I know that, but you haven't really answered my question. Anyway, yeah, go on. Yeah, but uh, we, we have we had two questions from Sasha Freiberg. Yes, yes, uh, we have uh, more questions. Uh, therefore, please first uh, two questions uh, from Sasha Freiberg and then a uh, question from Anna Kruglo. Comment. Yes, thank you, Katie, for your presentation. I think your book points to very crucial points. <clears throat> more than as a historical re-evaluation re or um, comparison, I see it as a contemporary intervention, so to say, which also poses questions like what actually is, is theory, I mean, uh, with a big T. Um, also, it uh, gives us something to, to think in relation with the old question about the primacy of ideas um, versus the primacy of structure or infrastructure. Mm. And this, this respect is, is very interesting. And this uh, relates to my first uh, question. I have two questions, one more concerning the reach of your method, I will, so to say, not pose a counter example, but pose a question because of a personal interest, but I think it matches uh, also uh, content wise, uh, the, um, the thematic uh, framework of your book, which I see as a kind of, um, well, attempt to, at least try to speak about something like communist ethics, you know, in a very basic sense. Um, in this respect, your critique of the Western left is very much the Schitzian, so to say, who thought that's the problem of, of the century is this kind of wrong left. Um, First question. Sasha, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, we are losing you. Now? Is it better now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, yes. sorry. Um, when you argue that the differences of Western and uh, Soviet perspectives are based more or less on socioeconomic conditions, um, I, I'm wondering what could uh, be the role, what, what role could the tradition play which is a kind of alternative to the, the Marxist uh, tradition and then to the Soviet tradition that is the German philosophy of culture. Um, mm -hmm. I have in mind in particular the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism which on the one hand developed alongside early Marxism uh, and developed a similar psychology, aesthetics, and socialist ethics, as we can see uh, in, in Ilyenko, for example, even in Lifshitz to some extent. Um, so my question would be, what would follow from your method and analysis in terms of this uh, tradition, this line which was cut because of political reasons? So the end we can explain with this method, but how can we account for its emergence? You know, um, this is um, interesting to me because I see a lot of parallels and hidden parallels in, in this tradition with uh, Marxism in general and the Soviets, especially Ilyenko speaking about the ideal culture and so on. This were exactly the same notions they stressed, the unity and plurality, dialectics, objective spirit, objective uh, um, or the objectivation in, in culture. So this uh, is so to say a kind of, uh, it seems to be irregular <laughs> in, in this kind of methodic framework. My second uh, question <clears throat> is, um, you talked about the hindering uh, that, that capitalism and for example, Ilyenkov's perspective was hindering the unity of thought and being. It's, I think a crucial question. Um, of course, then the question would um, arise in how far this relates 
to his his letter. Yeah. You already touched upon this, that there's a kind of tension between this um, yeah, philosopher's perspective about the unity of thought and being or theory and praxis and, and plant economy and administrative society. So in short, the problem of technocracy. Um, on the one hand, this pertains to the inner problem of the fellow. We will ask you again. Socialist, uh, rationalist um, mm. um, society. Uh, on the one, on the other hand, it's of course quite interesting as a contrast foil to today's more or less hidden ideological conditions and realities, like the problem of state intervention, which always have to has to be covered up, um, or you know, um, the um, regulations for property, for patents, and, and so on and so forth. So a kind of intervention for market uh, logics. Um, so there's no free market. You always have this kind of intervention, right? So the, the, question, the, the question pertains to what uh, would be, um, or are there hints uh, in Ilyankov towards the concrete economical or bureaucratic uh, organization? Do you have something in mind? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, be, before, before I proceed, uh, I have to leave you in a few uh, minutes and I made you co-host and I uh, will leave the conference running. So it's not pro no problem. I, I'm just uh, will not be with you anymore. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Great. Uh, it was a great pleasure. And thank you for sharing. Well, uh, concerning the German tradition, uh, I think I don't know it deeply enough, but you already told me about it, so it would be another contribution to refer back uh, to those notions when they had been lost in the uh, uh, contemporary theory after Second World War. Uh, culture, the ideal, the idea, etc. Uh, we simply did not inherit those notions. And I think it's already probably your um, preoccupation maybe to, uh, to demonstrate those connections. This would be really interesting. As for Ilyenkov, he was not an economist, but he definitely needed to interfere into, uh, um, into party organization. Uh, uh, firstly, as you mentioned, to somehow prohibit the um, development and spread of the um, cybernetic essentialism, which was very fashionable at the moment in 60s. And uh, his book was written, his, his book was published uh, uh, much later, but he worked on this issue on the critique of uh, uh, empiricism and uh, technical nominalism. Uh, but uh, as for his precise works on political economy, I think all his politeconomic analysis and how it tells on philosophy is in the uh, dialectics of the abstract and concrete. And what he does there, he shows that look at the politeconomic passages of Marx and now look how it works in uh, uh, daily life, in our reality, and look how philosophic it is. And look that this philosophy is possible to be implemented for the sake of socialist society. So he was trying to prove that Marxist political economy is absolutely realizable, but that at the same time, this realization is philosophic realization. So answering Ilya's question, Ilya Budraitsky's question, um, uh, uh, this society is philosophic because Marx is philosophic and not simply politeconomic. So conversely to, uh, leftist um, apologia of Marx about 11th thesis of Feuerbach uh, that uh, philosophers were trying to understand this work, but we have to change this work. Of course, this is true, but Ilyenkov shows that Marx's point is also uh, to show that 
the socioeconomic issues are nonetheless philosophic uh, and vice versa. Philosophic issues are nonetheless uh, social and economic. And I think this dialectics is crucial uh, for, for Elienkov uh, as for concrete administrative organization. Uh, I don't think he had access to that. Uh, 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 and Anna Kruglova had a question. Um, it's not so much a question, maybe a commentary. Unfortunately, I only heard about this book today, so I haven't read it. And um, uh, from what I can only understand is from my, what I heard today, but uh, I probably, my comment will be very good in terms of uh, kind of wrapping up this discussion, because I really want to thank you so much for writing this book. And I only regret that it hasn't been written in um, somewhere about 2014 and 15, when I was working on my dissertation, which was on the contemporary ethics of Russians of about like 30, 30, 40 year old. So those people who actually grew up in the late socialism, they were uh, raised in the, I would dare say, ontology, which was uh, the late socialist ontology. And unfortunately, as an ethnographer, I faced two kind of a double task. I first had to translate ethnographic reality, the uh, what my respondents say, what they, the ethical decisions which they take in their daily lives, into theory, which for, in my case was theory, of course the people which whom you mentioned, Michel Foucault, the Saint, Bruno Latour, Deleuze and Guattari, and so on and so forth, which constitutes the usual critical theory and philosophy, which kind of infuses the bachelor degrees in any uh, Western university. So, and I saw very uh, little kind of understanding how I can translate into that. While at the same time, I understand that when I started reading a lot of literature on the what was Soviet socialism and so on and so forth, historical anthropology for whatever little there is, but also uh, Boris Groys and uh, Sergei Ushak and so on and so on, many, many people. Uh, I also kind of couldn't, found, couldn't find real philosophical accounts which would take that system at its face value as indeed the systems of ethics and ontology and uh, look at it from the point of view of transnational philosophical usual problem, order, vices, how, chaos, abstract and concrete, mind and matter. I was literally flabbergasted. I always thought that my research was failing. There is this wonderful book somewhere, but I can't find it. But uh, then I despaired, it wasn't there. Uh, the Whatever little I found from people who took it kind of um, from this point of view was David Zilberman. I don't know if you heard about such a person uh, who was a very kind of, had a very interesting career of uh, mm -hmm. then moved to West and so on. So he basically was and uh, study, he studied Indian, um, uh, he was an Indologist, you would say. Mm -hmm. so he was an anthropologist or cultural studies scholar, area scholar. And he looked at the Soviet society from a point of view, which was not necessarily about institutions, history, state participation, gulag camps, and so on, but basically at the kind of a value system uh, per se, from a philosophical point of view. And he was very educated in Vedic philosophy. <clears throat> Yeah, so yeah, very interesting for me what you say, because uh, actually uh, you you usually get accusation for shifting yeah, to you got, you got yeah. Europe as well. Yeah. Why? Like how it's, it's exactly it's funny how talking about this requires daring. How dare you consider boredom as an emancipatory project? I mean, you're philosophers. You should dare consider boredom a bliss. Why would you even think about daring? And it's really, really funny that philosophers are so timid these days or so having blindfolds in their eyes could not possibly connect boredom with theory, uh, with uh, bliss, for instance. So when I was talking about um, desire or like looking at how people use desire 
they talk about what uh, anthropologists would call vitalism. We deal in, you know, animism, totemism, vitalism, that sort of mm -hmm. worldwide systems, and then trying to connect it. Uh, for instance, they talk about how the necessarily expenditure of desire, and indeed it's economism, it's a very economic kind of system, expenditure of desire would lead to suffering. I said, like, okay, how desire is connected to suffering? What should I read? My, uh, of course, supervisor would say, read Marquis de Sade. Ha, ha, ha. You understand what Marquis de Sade doesn't go into the libidinal economy at all. My leftist friend, who eventually, I don't know, read Kropotkin on who not, because he's a fashionable anarchist, he would talk, read Deleuze and Guattari, and I had Oedipus or whatnot. I read it and I understand that there is nothing suffering about there as well, because these people never lived this economy of desire. They theorized it, but they didn't, did not understand how it can be. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to your comments, because actually this was a, a very long way when I started this research and you, you hear accusation, why you are not applying Foucault precisely in this way? I apply Foucault, but I need to make differentiations because something functions, something doesn't function. And we have to make these divisions and you are absolutely right. So we need the tools. Yes, uh, well, in Russian, there is a saying, the tegivet savuna globus. This is how so often this happens. Basically to take an owl and try to stretch it over a global, which means, I don't know, in English it might be correspondence, to try to take something square and to put it on something round, right? This is what usually happens when you're trying to do these things. So the starting point exactly should not be either Michel Foucault or some other saint. It should be actually something which is taken at face value or maybe some general ideas like exactly order versus chaos, how people understand action, why action, agency and activity are three different things. And uh, semi local semiotic ideology may assume completely different understanding of what it means. Exactly. So basically, yeah, that, uh, that, that's sort of a kind of a thing. Uh, I simply, it was too daunting because it required to write two books at once and it required a philosophical education, which I do not have, so I'm kind of sorry. Usually anthropologists have a bliss of either having official and vernacular ideology sort of understand and uh, kind of coincide like Papua New Guinea, you do not have a system of institutions who worked for 70 years to socially engineer for people a way of life and ethics and consciousness and something else. So Marilyn Strathairn can go and just talk with her respondents and from there derive her ontology. Historical context sort of almost doesn't exist there from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in India, you have a caboodle of local philosophers who for, I don't know, third generation will connect it from whoever the Vedic kind of local mm -hmm. tradition with and so on and so forth. It just doesn't happen. So um, yeah, I can understand that uh, I have, I'm a bit emotional about it because no, but it's also the questions for also so long and no one can answer me. Everybody would say, why? There is this constant institutionalism when what was socialism, what was next was always about some sort of institution. We had critique of that, nothing happened. Nothing happened. I nothing. think that, that there should be separate debate on that. This is very important, which brings different points, East and West, and generally the universality of the theory that claims to be universal in terms of emancipatory theory as such. So, so th these are great points. I think we are exceeding the time, which, which is the time of the Wishka school. And um, maybe we have to wrap up. And I would like to thank everyone uh, I, I hope that we could meet on other sessions and for other occasions. And it was extremely precious for me to have this debate and discussion. And I'm looking forward to, to other meetings. So, um, yes. Great. And ciao. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. -bye.